Expedition 44 here with Matt, Ryan, and Jana. We have been on a pilgrimage of doing a series on hell, and we've covered a lot of ground here. The introduction kind of set the stage for a lot of things, and then we went to Annihilation, Universal Reconciliation, and ECT with a segment from Chris Date towards the beginning of that. So today we're kind of bringing a conclusion to the whole series. We've gotten some questions throughout the series, so we're going to answer those. But in starting, I want to come back to, I think, where we start every film, and that's saying, how does your view of hell influence or is influenced by the whole lens of scripture and your major tenets of faith. We need to make sure that we major on the majors. And to me, one of the most major things is that God is a God of love. God is a, a love of grace and mercy mm -hmm. and wants to have a personal relationship with me. So when I look at that as the overending theme that he loves everyone and desires those things with everybody, where where does that leave me and my understanding of hell as far as the scriptures go? Yeah, um, so your view of hell is correlated to your view of God. Yes. So it, it, they strongly connect. Um, Jana, uh, after... Oh. I got it. <laughs> you got it. All right. I got it. I got so, it. Exodus 34, God says... What and I love his own this character is because Moses wanted to know, you know who who are you God, and I love that you know we should just go by what God describes Himself as being, yeah. and He says these things about Himself: I am compassionate, the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And he goes on and says, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet does He does not leave the guilty unpunished. So there's the justice part of yeah. it. Mm -hmm. There's part of us that's. We, we really need justice. Mm -hmm. um, he said he punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents, but it's to the third and fourth generation. So Forever. I love that he, his, <laughs> <Yeah>. his <laughs> love goes on for you know thousands of generations, mm -hmm. but the punishment lasts for three or four. Yeah. You know? yeah. So in terms of the scales of where yeah. love and, term, and mm -hmm. his justice, he's going to go, I am way more loving and way more merciful than I am going to be in justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we're if we're describing God and looking at the lens of the scriptures, this is what we always have to go back to. Great mm -hmm. point. Yep. Yeah. God. God is. Uh, he's a God of love. He's also a God of justice, and that's kind of what we've been getting at this entire series. Yep. That God is equal scales. Yeah. And he's not a monster. That's right. <laughs> so let's let's look at where we've been, the journey that we've kind of gone down. We started with. Um, the annihilation thinking. What is that? The annihilation thinking is that when people die, they are dead. They're not continuously conscious in some other realm. And then when Jesus sounds his trumpet and he comes back, there is a resurrection, rain for a thousand years, and then there's another resurrection. And based on what people have done, they will either be granted access into this kingdom where they will be citizens mm -hmm. of this amazing yeah, kingdom of life. life and righteousness. And if they have over, like, I think they really have to make a, a rejection that is so sound and so complete that there is no hope of them ever becoming citizens of this kingdom. That they, they die for the second time and that they cease to exist forever. Mm -hmm. So they're not consciously being tormented forever. They just... Are, are gone. They're mm -hmm. dead. They're that's destroyed. Right. And so that's, in short, what my thought is about that. And the major thing. strength of this interpretation is that Old and New Testaments are going to very mm -hmm. much agree. Yes. You're not going to have to mm -hmm. do any crazy gymnastics. Mm -hmm. yep. You're just reading the verses. There, there really is very little to argue with mm -hmm. when, you, when you get to the end of it. Yeah, and so they don't have to reinterpret death and mm -hmm. to die is to die. Those who reject the Lord are dead. There's some separation and we're okay with that. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, the second view is universal reconciliation. So yeah, universal reconciliation shows that um, uh, God's purpose was to reconcile everyone. Jesus saves the world and so in the end all will come to God yeah. through the work of Jesus. And now uh, we've talked about and that this isn't pluralism. It's through Jesus' yeah. sacrifice and through the resurrection. It's applied that 
all die in Adam, but all live in Christ. And the major strength of this is there's several verses that seem to go this way, and then when you're just getting back to the big lens of Scripture, the big picture, you have to ask the questions, uh, does God want all to come to him? Well, mm -hmm. the Bible's very yeah. clear about that. Now, is God powerful enough mm -hmm. that he can find a way for yep. all to come to and him? In this view, like we've went over in our video, doesn't, um, it doesn't push judgment to the side. There is judgment, but the judgment is restorative. It's corrective. Um, those who are in sin, that sin is going to be corrected like a good parent would correct their child to its behavior. Yeah. And so that was, is the purpose of hell in the universalist view. If there is a weakness to this one, it would be that there seems to be a lack of immediacy of judgment or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the last view that uh, we most recently did is eternal conscious torment. And this view is basically going to say that all are going to be that all that are not with Christ that are separated from Christ uh, at death into and after judgment are going to be tormented in a conscious state forever and ever. And we've kind of said that there's about six or seven scriptures that would seem to have that kind of descriptive language, but the biggest proof is going to be tradition. Mm -hmm. Is that for 2,000 years, this is the way people have primarily been thinking right or wrong. Yeah. There's also a last view, and we haven't made a film on this because it's a very minor view, and that would be called the orthodox view of hell. And this one, one of the reasons why we haven't made a view is because this is very abstract. If you talk to different people that claim they have an orthodox view of hell, you're going to get a very different notion from those people. So I'm not even sure that I feel good about trying to explain mm -hmm. what that looks like yeah. because most of these are just extremely abstract and people have different ideas or, or different things. But essentially what it's saying is everybody basically is going to go into some eternal forever state and they're going to be in a presence of God. This mm -hmm. is the only one that really doesn't do anything with the separation verses. And so they're all going to be there, but it's in the way that you react to God. So some people in their reaction to God's grace, you might call it, are going to be in an eternal state of happiness and joy because mm -hmm. they love those things. And then you're going to have the others, whether they're across the river or over in a figurative dark place, mm -hmm. they're going to be also in the presence of God, but their reaction to that presence is going to be very dismal, very, very mm -hmm. tormented almost in some views. Yes. Yep. So yeah, those are kind of the the four views, three three yeah. views. Three and a half. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've received uh, a couple questions based on some of our episodes from some folks at, at church. Yeah. And so we're going to address a couple of those today in our conclusion and then go through our framing questions that we started out in our intro. So the first question that I got was, what about the fate of Satan and the fallen spiritual beings? All right. So whenever I hear Satan, I, I have to preface this scripturally. <laughs> so being an Old Testament person, when I look at the Old Testament, I see spiritual beings that have fallen. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people are going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and look at the snake and kind of pin that as the Satan figure. And I'm not convinced, you know, he may or may not be. I don't care to win that argument mm -hmm. or not win that argument. Yeah. But throughout the Old Testament, you don't really necessarily get a Satan figure. You get a challenger or an accuser. An adversary. An yes. adversary. You get a whole lot of spiritual beings that seem to be the evil fallen yeah. adversaries. Uh -huh. Those those are in direct disagreement with God. It's not until the New Testament that you kind of get this idea that one has risen to command the powers of evil mm -hmm. and that risen you know, person that is now leading the forces is who we would kind of view as the Satan figure. And so yeah. you get into the revelation thinking, uh, you yeah. know, end times, things like Serpent, that. Yeah. And you, you start getting these ideas that there's a Satan figure, there's going to be a beast, there might be an antichrist or several antichrists. There's going to be all these fallen spiritual powers and authorities and the lake of fire was created to throw all of them into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting with the Satan stuff. We did a video in our Job series on the, on the Satan. Yeah. 
Uh, often it's kind of in God's heavenly counsel, the uh, prosecuting attorney. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of what we see in the book of Job. Um, but yeah, so the, the fate of these, it, it's a great question because we see in Matthew um, 25 that um, hell, Gehenna, or whatever he's using there, is created for uh, the fallen spiritual beings. Yeah. And we see in Revelation 20 that the, the death in Hades and the dragon are, are thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah. Um, so, but it says they're tormented forever and ever. Well, remember Revelation is um, apocalyptic and we yeah. talked about like what Chris State said the, it's visions but then it has an interpretation what does what do those how are those visions interpreted I always also have to preface this don't put too much of your theology in your understanding of Revelation because it's just the you, hardest book to interpret it's the hardest <laughs> book to interpret you can you can interpret it this way or that way or mm -hmm. or we just don't know mm -hmm. you have to you have to leave a lot of it. So I leave Revelation alone and say, well, what do we get from the rest of the Bible? Yep. That's a better interpretation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 1 Corinthians 2.6 says, uh, now Paul always uses like powers, principalities, yep. rulers, not as human things, but he sees the spiritual beings behind those rules. And when he uses those stock phrases, the principalities, powers, rule, rulers, and authorities, yep. he's thinking spiritual beings there. Yep. He's not thinking mankind mm -hmm. yeah. um so when in first corinthians 2 6 the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing yeah. he's talking about the judgment yeah so they're coming to nothing so that's it's, not it's interesting that he starts off early in first corinthians mm -hmm. 2 talking about this then towards the end of first corinthians in 15 he kind of comes back to that kind of thinking too yeah first corinthians 15 uh 24 to 28 and the end will come when he hands the kingdom over to the father after he has destroyed all dominion authority and power same wording yep for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet the last enemy to be destroyed is death when he's put everything under his feet then he'll say um, now when it says everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. But when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him and put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Yeah. So if the last enemy to be destroyed is death, that kind of seems that all the enemies before death are destroyed. Yeah. And I say this so often, but we give Satan way too much credit most mm -hmm. of the time. You know, this is not the great huge adversary of god you yeah. know that that's what we want to make them out to be but there's all kinds of fallen principalities powers and i love that paul keeps that in check mm -hmm. yep so yeah um we also see the reason jesus came for first john 3 8 jesus came to destroy the works of the devil yeah yeah so there are some problem passages in Revelation. You know, Revelation 14, there's really no mention of Satan. And that's why yep. I kind of keep going back yeah. to that. And mm -hmm. it's not that I want to take Satan out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to do that. Yeah. I, do, I do see Satan as the one who is going to go in the wilderness and try to tempt Jesus for 40 days. And mm -hmm. even today, I think he's still alive and very much in action with or without other spiritual beings. I'm not really sure what that looks like. Again, we, we yeah. don't have the cards there. We're not yeah. we're not given there. But when you get into Revelation 40, what we find is there's so much figurative language and when we read most of it, mm -hmm. it's it's doesn't say what people think it said yeah. for a yeah. long time. Yeah, Revelation 20 says that Satan will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But those thrown in the lake of fire experience the second death. Yeah. So, um, so we also see in the Aramaic Targums um, that that second death means to be killed. Um, we see in Revelation 21, verse 4, that death and the old order have passed away. Yeah. That old order is usually s uh, Satan's rule. Um, so I think this is probably the strongest case for Satan being tormented forever and ever. But when we look at how should we interpret yeah. Revelation... Um, the lake of fire in Revelation 20 were shown like what Chris Day is saying, the visions, like go back to Joseph. He had right. these visions right. and then uh, Joseph interpreted the dreams. So if we take the same Old Testament template there and, and use yeah. it here in Revelation, these, this is a vision that yeah. John is seeing. The interpretations given in Revelation 20 verse 21, 4, which shows that the lake of fire equals the second death and that second death equals destruction. Yeah. Yeah. So so that so it could we could see that yeah though it says that um, eternal torment 
that it actually, what it means, the interpretation is what it means is death. So we have a very clear picture in Second Corinthians, and when we get to mm-hmm. Revelation, it's definitely a little more figurative, yeah. yep. you know, hard to, get, hard to wrap your arms around. So if you're going to, you know, come away with some kind of a view or some kind of major theological um, holding, you, you would be better to stick from what is solid in the Bible, what I'd say Second Corinthians, and really I'd go back to all of the Old Testament mm-hmm. um, and say, this is what the lens says. And you get this a lot. Um, you know, Psalm 82 says, you know, those spiritual beings yeah. are going to die like men. Mm-hmm. That's pretty clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 10, 28, or it talks about, um, so it says that God does have the ability to kill s- souls. Now, even if we take that angels or whatever are eternal, yeah. Or even if we take it that a soul is eternal. Right. It says in Matthew ten twenty eight that God has the prerogative to destroy the body and the soul. So yeah. if he can destroy an eternal soul, why can't he destroy a eternal being? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? God has the power to do it. Some of the questions that we've got I th- I think um are really good and this these don't get talked about enough. Like mm-hmm. I've never heard a sermon preached from a pulpit and evangelicals are going to kind of want to throw rocks or stones when you start having this. But the best question is, what what is really hell? I mm-hmm. mean, is, is it, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to get the ECT side that traditionally is going to say that hell is a real place. It exists after mm-hmm. judgment, after the life. It's forever burning and tormenting and things like that. But those that are going to fall in any of the other views, mm-hmm. the orthodox views, the um, conditional immortality, uh, any any of the other views, a question that comes up is, if you're getting into figurative language and metaphors and revelations and visions and things like that, and you're getting most of your view from that, then is it really real? There, I said it, just like that. Yeah. Is, is, is this a real, a real place? place or is this just kind of a metaphorical allusion to where people that are not with God are going to end. Yeah, yeah, the end end result. So we've kind of alluded to when we look at what was it uh, the Thessalonians one nine, Second Thessalonians one nine of the destruction coming from the presence of the yeah. Lord. Yeah, it doesn't seem that the, if that if that is the picture of the final judgment, there people say, well, is that happening in hell? Or it says it's in God's presence. If hell's supposed to be separation, how do you deal with those things? Yeah. Um, then you got the lake of fire. Uh, we just talked about about that. Um, is the lake of fire an actual place? Are the flames metaphorical? Could Jesus be using Gehenna as a picture of the results of what happened as that Old Testament Jeremiah tradition? Or is it yeah. a place you're actually cast into? Is he paint using the place of Gehenna right. as a picture of what's going to happen or is it actual place someone's going to be so it's no secret that all three of us have landed on conditional immortality um, when I think about that I think about really what the Bible speaks to death in the the finality of eschatology the end times what's it going to look like and so if you are stuck on ECT and a lot of people are. Mm-hmm. It's been ingrained to their thinking for a long time. This is a tough conversation. This is one that you're, it's going to take a while for you to get past this yeah. and probably a lot of studying and mm-hmm. things like that. And so if you're in the ECT camp, you're going to be really struggling with this question of is hell actually a real place? If that's if 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 your framework is ECT, then you're going to arrive that it is a real place mm-hmm. and that it exists forever and ever and the mm-hmm. gnashing of teeth and all this kind of you know stuff. If you're if you're not in the ECT camp, if you're in any of the other ones, then it becomes a real question to you of, you know, if death is death, is there really need any any real need for anything beyond that. Yeah, um, it's interesting in the Orthodox view, they don't have a place called hell because everybody's in the presence of God. Yeah. Uh, most of the other views kind of see a, a separation to, to, to yeah. a place. And I could, I could go uh, either way on whether it's a real place or a picture of, of an action. I and mean, we talked about Greg Boyd's view where he believes in annihilation, but he's just like when people have rejected God and the invitation to come into the kingdom, that 
it, I like the way C.S. Lewis says there's going to be two kinds of people. One who says, God, your will be done. And one's that who God says to them, your will be done. And yeah. his will, since God's the sustainer, he takes his sustaining hand off of them. And they they just go into non-existence. They die. Way to do it. Yeah. And so yeah. does that require a place? Or is it just right. God, since God is all in all and is omnipresent and we live and move and have our being in him yeah if we don't want to be in him it, i don't think it necessarily demands a place so the hardest thing for me is that i think our mainstream american evangelical community is really afraid to ask the question of what uh, to go here to, mm-hmm. to say what does the scripture actually really teach and i think that if you can bring yourself to a place where you're just completely unbiased and you're just going to say, I'm going to read all of this as if it's the first time I've ever read it before and I'm going to try to land on the view that is the most scripturally accurate. That's what all of our films are about. Yep. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And to us, when you when you do that, the ECT view seems really far-fetched. It seems mm-hmm. like it's really not consistent with the nature of God. It's really out there. I think we can all be hopeful universal reconciliationist because (laughs) who wouldn't want everyone to come to God but then we struggle with some of the passages that don't really quite seem to go that way so I'm a little as much as I'm hopeful I'm a little skeptical of that too and orthodox I just don't really know what to do with that one I it just doesn't I'm not sure I think it fits the whole lens of everything, but if I get to heaven and God says, oh yeah, this is the way it is, those are those guys over there, this is me, I'm going to be okay with that, mm-hmm. you know, and I think at that point it's going to be revealed to me and I'm going to get how it all works. Now, the last one again is um, annihilation and that just seems to, particularly in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, just be the 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 least amount of theological gymnastics, slicing, dicing, mm-hmm. moving things around. Yep. You just read it and you go, oh, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's an understanding in all the views that some of it is figurative language, metaphorical, you know, allegory, things like that. And so some might say that the those in the annihilation camp are going to look at them more that way than the other ones. And I'm not sure that's true either. Yeah. I think that they're all looking at them as... as Parts of that. Yeah, so uh, we began in our intro with some framing questions. So we're just going to kind of have a conversation around um, these five or six things that we, we framed our discussion initially with. So coming back full circle and yeah. to say, all right, based on everything that we've gone through, all this digging, the research we've done, the conversations that we've had with each other and with you guys, um, where do we land? Where do we land at the end here? So the first one is going to be you're going to have to decide on whether you think that the Bible describes more of a courtroom scene going into hell or whether it's a covenant relationship. So yeah, um, I, I personally land more on the covenantal side and um, I kind of came to this actually when I was doing my master's thesis when I was digging into justification and how it really in the Jewish mindset and even in the Greco-Roman mindset, it wasn't so much of a law court. And yeah. though you kind of get some imagery of it, yeah. it's not the primary metaphor for it. And the thing that the ruling was, it it wasn't Lady Justice who, who determined everything. Yeah. It it was God's covenant with, with his people that, that it was the, the bar for it. Yeah. So, yeah. And some of this covenant courtroom thing, uh, you know, I, I've brought out the idea that we're not Calvinists. We're not Reformed in any way. And if you are Reformed, you're really going to struggle with this a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Even, in our, even in our film with Chris Day being that he was Reformed, you can kind of see him. There's a couple times that he wanted to mm-hmm. believe the the more Reformed mm-hmm. things, but he's like, but that's just not what yeah. I see in Scripture. So there's yeah. kind of this pulling mm-hmm. to it. So, you know, if you're starting from a Reformed background, you, you are going to have a harder time because it's so ingrained, mm-hmm. where if you're coming from a Spirit-led free will church or something like that, this isn't going to be as hard of an argument because it's kind of built on more covenant thinking. Yeah, and what we mean by covenant is family. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what we mean when we say covenant is like how how do does God lay down a law like in a courtroom or do we do it like how you interact with your family and friends? Um, yeah, where I arrived on this covenant is when I started looking at the at what we translate as the law. Mm-hmm. And the Hebrew was Torah, yeah. yes. which basically meant instruction. Yeah. Yeah. So God was coming alongside his people and saying, 
listen, I've got the secrets of the universe. Yeah. If you will come to me, I will be your, um, I will be your, your father and your God, and I'm going to teach you guys how to live and prosper in this world yeah, so that good. other nations yep. who are looking at you guys can see how, what a wise and awesome God you have. Yeah. So then, it, you know, how does God deal with sin? Well, that, that changes the whole dynamic yeah. of what sin is. It's, it's it's not a law, it's an instruction. Yeah. Yeah. And God entreats us to come and be persuaded to live the way that he wants us to live. And there's blessing in that. Yeah. So it's not a punishment versus reward. It's a, this is my, this is my father. I trust him with my life. It's a completely different yeah. idea, idea of living and, yeah. and interacting with mm-hmm. the creator. And it does, if you follow that Old Testament thinking, then all of a sudden when you get to Jesus establishing the new covenant, then mm-hmm. it really becomes yeah. right. rich, you know? And uh-huh. you're going, right. oh, Christ. Christ is the bride of the church. Well, that sounds actually very similar to the way this covenant started. started yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah. Um, next, we look at um, the idea of sin and God's ultimate victory. Um, which view do you guys think gives God the biggest victory? Yeah. So, if we do know that the Bible says that that God wins, mm-hmm. and, and in the end, God is going to be victorious over the evil principalities and the sin of the world. So. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, so if you look at the eternal torment view, sin is never actually done away with because mm-hmm. the thing that the eternal torment view says is people will continue sinning in hell, and that's why the the torment goes on forever. So that's one of their views. The uh, the other one is the this if you sin against an eternal being, that's your punishment really is eternal. Point. I never yeah. really thought yeah. that line of thinking through. Could sin ever really be, be conquered? Con- yeah. 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 It was. Did Christ really win at the cross? Mm-hmm. If yeah. that's what you're saying. Yeah. So that view, sin seems to win, and not God. Yeah. The annihilation. Yeah. The, the ones who reject God are done away with, and I also believe the spiritual beings will be destroyed. Yeah. Um. And so God will be all in all. There will be no sin in creation. It, it'll be a place like, as it says in Second Peter three, I believe, a place where only righteousness dwells. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and you might argue the strongest view is the hopeful, rec- mm-hmm. you know, universal recognition so that everybody is going to come back. Yeah. That God can and does and will do that. So. Yeah. The other one that we come to, and I've I've said this in just about every other video, is how do you frame God? Are you going to frame God as more of a lawyer or more of a doctor, a healer? Mm-hmm. So definitely the um, ETC view would say a lawyer, that he's judge. So, um, but then the conditionalists can go either way. Yeah. They they can go either way Uh, on this view. There's some that kind of take more of uh, the framework of ECT, but see annihilation. They'll still see the courtroom imagery in, in annihilation. There's others that, well, like Boyd taking his hands off more covenant uh, family type thinking of not um, allowing your children to um, basically keep keep going sometimes you have to kick them out of the house for their own good (laughs) Um, to not enable them Um, and so they'll they'll see it in in that that way but um, universalism definitely sees the doctor side yeah that God is a healer yeah the grand healer then mm-hmm. that he heals all things in mm-hmm. the end all things will be reconciled to mm-hmm. him and healed is what that means yeah and we see in acts that yeah that, that jesus is going to be the judge at, yeah. at the end um but we see that he came as the great physician yeah. mm-hmm. um he came and healed diseases he came and cast out demons and so we we see a bigger picture of um our picture of jesus is more of a doctor than a lawyer I- I think where we have to land is when God was naming his son mm-hmm. and he told, he told Mary, um, you're going to name him. It's Jesus in our translations, but in, in, in the Hebrew it would have been Yeshua, mm-hmm. which has the very name salvation. Mm-hmm. Like Yeshua yeah. does mean salvation. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to land on, like if God was sending Jesus as a lawyer, certainly his name would have reflected would have named him that. Would yeah. 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 right? Yeah. The great judge or something. The great yeah. judge. But yeah. he didn't. He named him Salvation, Yeshua. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we have to land on whatever it is that God is trying to communicate what his son's primary 
um, purpose in coming. I think that sometimes you also need to come back to just the big lens of scripture and major on the majors. And so sometimes people get really hung up with this idea of revelation judgment. And we don't have much on it. I mean, it's crazy when you look at the Bible and you, you study the verses that actually talk about the, the final judgment or the great judgment or something like that. We really know very little yeah. about it. And the largest motif in the entire Bible is the Exodus. Yeah. <laughs> so God yeah. delivering his people from evil. Yeah. And and that didn't have anything to do with the courtroom right. scene. And it's the what Paul and Jesus and the whole Old Testament is all framed yeah. around um, a picture of an Exodus and a new Exodus yeah. and then an ultimate Exodus. So when you kind of finish with these doctor lawyer things, you, you land with justice. If you're going to talk about the great judgment and what happens there, then you kind of come back to is justice retributive or restorative? Yeah, um, we kind of see both in scripture yeah. that, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, even as parents, like when we um, discipline our kids, it's it's retributive a little bit. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to pay for what what they did, but I mean, we're not going to torture them, yeah. they, they, like get off the electronics or something right. like that. But it's for the purpose of restoration yeah. um, to teach them and correct their character and that's what a loving parent does and yeah. god is the ultimate loving parent and so we kind of see both but we're not going to enable our kids in their sin and i don't think god would also so that's why i think that it comes back to for me conditional immortality makes the, the most sense as much mm -hmm. as i want to see universal reconciliation yeah and i think sometimes the ect camp makes it sound like neither of the other views take any kind of judgment that's simply not true no. they they all take they all look at the judgment of god and what's mm -hmm. going to happen there's just different interpretations as far as that go mm -hmm. now i go back to the old testament again i i it probably sounds like a broken record to you mm -hmm. guys but i keep going back to eden it starts with eden and it ends in a picture eden. that looks very similar and so when i when, when that's ingrained in my thinking, I don't know what to do with ECT. It just mm -hmm. doesn't seem to fit. Yeah. So uh, kind of our next question that we framed is, so how does our view of hell make sense of the narrative of creation beginning and ending in Eden and the purpose of humanity bearing God's, being the image of God and bearing God's name? I want to say that we've made a video on this one, yeah. but I think we've made about four uh, videos on this We one. always come to this point. <laughs> The Im image yeah. of God bearing God's name as his people. So how does hell play into that that picture? Which yes. view? And that's going to push you back into saying, what is your view of God where we started? Mm -hmm. What Jana read. Is this your view of God? Have you made mm -hmm. out God to be more monstrous mm -hmm. than more loving? Mm -hmm. Where do you fall? Yeah, we talked about sin being idolatry. So the disease and the symptoms at the beginning. Um so if ultimately sin is judged, our idolatry, our unallegiance towards God is the thing that's that that's judged. Yeah. Um, it, we make it out to be moral perfection is that we're judged on, right. where our purpose is to bear God's image, to be His image bearers here on earth, to reflect Him out into creation, and to do do His will. Yeah, morality and ethics and all that play into it, but. They're kind of the symptoms. Our primary calling is kind of what I see the scripture more yeah. point, pointing to that glory that was given to mankind from Psalm 8 is is really the, the judgment. Yes, we are judged on the moral stuff. We're judged by the works done in the body. Yeah. And so we'll see kind of both. But I think the primary aspect is ends with Eden, begins with Eden. What happened in Eden? It was God calling us to be his image bearers. And so that's the purpose of the restoration. So yep. how's that fit into hell? Right. I mean. <laughs> and I think you hit some on something really important, Ryan. You said people are afraid whenever these kind of subjects come the into words, the kingdom. Yeah. And I was trying to think of why. Why are people, why is fear? Yeah. The, and maybe a little bit of anger. Yeah. The first uh, emotional response. And I wonder if it's just because we hold our view of God so tightly that if someone tries to rock that view of how we view God, um, it does make us a little insecure. Yeah. Like, oh my yeah. goodness, yeah. maybe I have viewed things incorrectly. And I would just like to say, um, 
You know, one of Jesus's prayers was, thy kingdom come, they will be done mm -hmm. on earth as it is in heaven. And I think we're all journeying to figure out exactly what God's will is. Yeah. And so I would encourage people to, you know, hold your beliefs of God kind of loosely. And when they are kind of pushed back and challenged a little bit, say your will be done. I think God loves these kind of conversations yeah. mm -hmm. and in the spirit in the which we are able to, to yeah. have these kind of conversations because ultimately we're, we're wanting God's image to be shown accurately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think he smiles at these kind of yeah. conversations because we're doing his kingdom work. Yeah. We're letting his kingdom come and be done on earth. And I think it's when we get closer to what his vision is for the world and able to articulate that so people can hear that, I think he, I think Jesus applauses that. So I wanted to say thank you for letting me be part of listening to a large in part to your discussion, <laughs> but also um, throwing my two cents. This has been fantastic and um, I hope it, it's been helpful to the listeners as well. Very good. So I think um, one thing that I just encourage you is to just consider some of these views. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't come to a great understanding of hell without a lot of research. Lot I've of research. probably got more time into hell than any other mm -hmm. singular research area in, in my life. and. You know, it's taken me a long time to make this video mm -hmm. because of that, yep. you know, and uh, I think that as you're as you're getting this, these videos might be the first time you've ever heard that there's another scriptural view out there mm -hmm. that, that makes sense, that that is that is conservative, that that shows the nature of God. And so don't feel like you have to change your mind overnight. I mean, just mm -hmm. let, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let some commentary books speak to you. Get 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 into just saying, what does the scripture best say? And it will be a beautiful process, a beautiful journey. That's what we always speak to. Yeah. May God bless you and keep you.